I'm not sure what it is about this that occurred to me, unless it was talking earlier about church dogma and um, how dangerous it is. And I, I had a moment of uh, gratitude, which may seem uh, would seem odd, said in most churches, but that I. Um, that I live in a congregation where you're willing to say, that's not right, in the middle of a sermon. Because that's really helpful. Because, you know, we all get off on our things. And it's easy to use this as a, a place from which, you know, sort of authority gets spoken. And I, uh, I don't know, I said something the other day about, uh, in the month of October, you're not going to see me very much. And I said something on Facebook about being chased out of the pulpit by, uh, and somebody wrote, a minister wrote and said, oh my God, that's really terrible. I'm like, no, actually, it's pretty great. It's pretty great. I won't, you won't see me much in October, but you know, you're going to get some great stuff happening. And how lucky we are that there's so many different viewpoints. So one, each person is worthwhile to be kind. Um, at first, it looked as if this should be pretty straightforward. Principles one and two are pretty darn simple. One, every person is a precious child of this universe. Two, treat them that way. End of sermon, time for coffee. But before you go, there were just a couple things I wanted to say. At our wor recent worship committee meeting, there was loads on the agenda. And some we haven't even gotten to yet. Texas, remind me to keep pursuing Texas in a joint uh, church service, um, like a Skyped-in church service with people down there in a church that's working with the kids at the um, border. Um, and so you heard some welcoming words today around the joys and concerns, because we're trying to think about being as broad and inclusive as we exclusive good inclusive as we can. And we're going to try singing the kids out to the Seven Principles song. It seemed that if our children were learning those principles, we should know them. And um, it's one reason we sing Jeannie's song, or I you know, sort of insist that we sing Jeannie songs at all our important liturgical moments, along with the fact that I like it, and one of our own wrote it, and exciting, you know, when I've gone somewhere to preach, I've taken it, and Stephen's been invited to preach in uh, Tawanda, Tawanda. Um, and uh, he's going to take it up there, so it's, it's a mission we carry out into the world, which is exciting, and makes Jeannie happy, but um, so we're going to think about that a little bit this year, and I invite you when you come into the service or perhaps during um, the prelude when you're not being marvelously entertained, which is hard to consider, uh, but you might um, take a second to read the principles and review our sources. Use them as a centering tool. And Sarah also asked, would I preach about them from time to time? So here you are, first go, two out of the way. As many of you know, I grew up down the road in a Presbyterian church. There I would say that the fundamental building block of my theology was a silly song. Never underestimate the power of a song. Songs lodge in a whole bunch of places in your brain. Some of you may also remember this or been raised up with it, but Jesus loves the little children. Staying true to that little ditty has gotten me in all kinds of trouble, especially when I realized that the second verse should read, Red and yellow, gay and straight, Jesus teaches love, not hate. <laughs> Jesus loves the little children of the world, and the big ones too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the beloved Dalai Lama was heard to say the other day in an, in, an, in, an, in an interview, it's compassion that we need. It's compassion that religions share. And if we have to say that it lowers your blood pressure for people to adopt it, he said, well, I say go for it. Oh, your holiness, you are indeed the bee's knees. <laughs> I am, I must admit, overset by the violence and stupidity we're seeing. It's not just Ray Rice or even, um, what's her name, Solo? Hope. There's a, big, there's a big thing going now about why is that not domestic violence. If Ray is domestic violence, why isn't hope? Um, so it's not just, it's the people who justify him as a good guy. 
It's not just the unconscionable beating of the two gay guys in Philly, it's the lawyer's willingness to say that it was self-defense, and it's more. The Philadelphia Archdiocese may have fired the coach, but they've been bleeding about homosexuality and abortion for years. You just heard me say this. Can you hear and hear and hear that homosexuality is wrong and not feel somehow justified in reaching to some weapon, any weapon, to defeat it? It's Kanye West's decision not, that not only does he know best how everyone should enjoy his concert, but you also need to justify your sitting in a wheelchair to him as if your disability were not your own business and you were not capable of deciding whether or not you could stand up at his concert. He sent people around at a concert, I don't know how many of you heard this, to check to see whether the people were, who were sitting down after he had said, you know, everybody needs to be on their feet to say, are you really disabled? You, really? You know, one guy took his prosthesis off and waved it around. <laughs> right? Um, when the local coach suggested that Rice was a good guy who might not have beaten his fiancée if he'd attended a reunion, he not only willfully misunderstands domestic violence, and this on a campus that's already roiling with allegations about violence against women, he sort of misses the point about nice and good. Now, good and nice are namby-pamby words we often use, incorrectly one might argue, to describe people who don't rock the boat. He's so nice. What a good guy. Good guy, as he uses it in this article, has no value whatsoever. We're so frightened, it seems, to admit that someone might really be responsible for a crime or of a certain behavior. Most people are sophisticated enough to distinguish between a whole person and incidents of violence. We hope we're sophisticated enough, because otherwise, if he's a nice guy, there's no way to hold him accountable for bad behavior. Has this happened because we let go of confessions of and forgiveness of sin? If I do not believe that someone forgives me, even myself, can I not, can I not then believe in confessing my wrongdoing? Stupid, ugly, violent things are happening. If you don't read the newspaper or social media, you hear about it here. Get your red-hot rhetoric right here. And it's not just active violence. It's ignoring things that are happening. I saw pictures from L.A. the other day. It looks like a dust bowl. Our country. Much of it just, you know, pointing to the reason people are marching. The searching we need to do when we're in church and when we're at home is not simply about how does all this stuff happen, but also how do we work to make sure that this does not continue to happen or to happen again. You know one of my themes is community. I'm always asking, why community? I'm always wondering how to do it better. Many communities, when they form, form around a single ideal. That causes the group to look inward toward that ideal and toward other believers. What happens then is that the group closes itself off. Here's the good in the center, and so let's face inward toward that. You use have no central idea, but rather some agreements about principles. Maybe a good image for our community is one of spiritual aerobics. We turn in for worship and outward for shared seeking. And or in, 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 for wor worship and shared seeking, for food and laughter and comfort, we turn outward for more inspiration and take our work out into the world. It's good core work, good core work. And we step up to the challenges that dis inspire or dismay us. We speak up as we are able. The turning inward and outward is to keep our spiritual core in shape and stepping up on the soapbox is great for our thighs, even as it's hard on aging knees. So is prayer, if you're one of those people who falls to them on a regular basis. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, martyr of the Nazi regime, says it is an evil time when the world lets injustice happen silently, when the oppression of the poor and the wretched cries out to heaven in a loud voice and the judges and rulers of the earth keep silent about it, when the persecuted church calls to God for help in the hour of dire distress and exhorts people to do justice, and yet no mouth on earth is opened to bring justice. In Jeremiah, God is reputed to have said to the poet, I put my words in your mouth. 
At the end of the service, when we envision taking that flame within us, it is not merely, I think, to strengthen us, but also to impel us to speech and action. After I went to the restaurant to talk to the joke-spewing table, I heard from a friend. This is a woman I know from college. She's got her PhD, worked for United Methodist Women all over the world, works in schools and churches to prevent d domestic violence. She wrote me to thank me for believing that what was said was true. It makes me crazy that this sister might ever be disbelieved. But the other day, while scrolling through Facebook one day, someone had posted a meme of Toni Morrison saying something about life's being more difficult when one was not white. And two people started talking about how stupid that she needed to make things about race and that you just needed to breathe in possibility and you could have it so people should just get over race. Have you seen that ad of the kids with the t-shirt that there are a bunch of little kids going, I'm so over race, racism, but racism is not over me? Right. But so for the second time that week, I was offered the opportunity to step up. When I look at what's going on, I have a couple different responses. One is that you use really are an answer. As we speak, Mary Howe has jammed people from Missouri on the bus to the climate change march after checking them into her house. They called, the, they called probably the church, got my number, called me, and um, I put, put out the note to you. I put out the note on Facebook. Next thing I know, I heard from Mary, who's with the unis, saying, we've got this, and off they go. Um, and I've asked for her to write me a note and give me some feedback on the march, and I know that um, <laughs> Emma and her mother Kathy are also on the march, I believe. Um, but the ideas behind the first and second principles, people's worth and the need for us to be kind, these are vital to changing what happens in the world. The fact that we recognize six sources is also vital. One of our most important jobs is training our kids, providing them not only with bedrock to stand on, but also companions for the long journey. They need to know the dance of in and out as something that people do and something that can empower them. We need to offer our kids not only examples of stepping up and saying no in explosive situations as gently as possible, but, also, but firmly, but also as many colleagues as we can give them. I believe that our worth and our belief in worth and dignity and the imperative to be kind are applications of faith. We want to teach our kids to figure out what they think by modeling our figuring out what we think. It's a tough and ongoing process. We're all learning on the road. None of us believe today what we believed as little as five years ago. We get smarter, better informed, enriched by this community. And, when we, and then we figure out how to offer that to the world. We figure out how to stand for those who need support or to stand for what is right. I invite your friends, I invite you to invite your friends who have children and we'll stuff their kids in the room with our kids and help them learn and teach and do because you know the world needs young hopeful allies. We have to encourage their dreams. Denzel Washington in a conversation with some actors said, while you need to have dreams, those dreams need to have goals. Without goals, dreams don't get realized. You need discipline and consistency. Hopefully we can teach some of that. Hopefully, we can learn some of that, because our kids need that from us. They need adults who are not jaded or dogmatic, but who are present. Our children are negotiating hard territory with enormous peer pressure to go along on things that start out like not seeming like a lot, but quickly become a lot. I don't know whether you saw the article, but an entire frat house somewhere in the Midwest was arrested for their housewide scheme to drug and rape young women. After first having um, merited them on a scale of attractiveness to see which drug they should get. Um, they'd established an elaborate system of horror. Luckily the police were alerted and everything was shut down before it had a chance to play out. But I wondered when talking to a friend about that how do you deal, how do you as a parent deal with that? What happens when it's your kid? And we all say, oh, it wouldn't be my kid. 
Could be. Could be. Is it all peer pressure? If it is, we'd better be working so the peer pressure our kids feel is toward the good. A friend of mine was at a wedding I did yesterday, and while she was waiting for the ceremony to start, she talked to a guy whose best friend was father of one of the kids who threw the rock from the overpass. It's, you know, it's stunning from what he had to say from where the guy, his friend stood, great family, a lot of outside, you know, they did a lot of things together. Um, but not only is that kid's life on a trajectory, but his parents' lives are ruined in many ways. Something later happened at school. He could have been provoked. You don't know, but he's, he, I'm sure, is scared to death. But his bail was revoked. His parents had put their house up as um, security. So they lose their house along with their son. And who knows what happens? I'm probably on thin psychological um, ice here. Um, so you can, you know, that can be one of those times that you chime in. But I have to at least wonder whether seeking community doesn't, impro doesn't provide something supportive and important for kids. I wonder if there are entire communities for the kid with the rock and the kid in that fr kids in that fraternity who are processing and mourning with that family. And from what this guy said, also these people have lost all their friends, you know, because you don't want to identify them with him because it might be, it might somehow be catching. And yet, aren't these community tragedies? If, as the Dalai Lama posits, compassion is at the base of every religious tradition, and even perhaps philosophical tradition. It's good to work toward that rather than heading in the opposite direction. You and I think differently. That's true. We probably believe differently. But we don't necessarily reach different conclusions. You've heard me say I'm a believer. You may also know that I find the divine feminine vastly important to me. I'm happy to talk about that on a one-on-one -on -one basis or if people are interested from the pulpit, particularly, um, but, however, if you need to tell me I'm stupid for my beliefs, uh, particularly before really understanding what and why I believe what I do and what I, and how then I act, Miss Manners will help me remind you that your opinion then about me is none of my business. I love her. I wanted to be her when I grew up. Since I couldn't be Molly Ivins, it was clear I was never going to be Molly Ivins. Um, I'm on a short fuse about, about this particular one and with nothing to do with any of you. It doesn't matter what gets talked about on Facebook. You can pretty much count on a couple of things to happen. First, one group of believers will hop on another. Then the atheists and the believers have at each other. And all the while, the children languish. Don't tell me you care about the children if what you want to do is beat up people who drive another route to get to the same place. Now I'm willing to push back if what people want to beat, beat up on other people about, or beat up, I'm not really ha happy about that, uh, is because they believe differently than you. I'm willing to push back. We'll do that. I was distressed about the bridal store incident in Bloomsburg and not at all unhappy to see the market react to the situation. I hope it ne leads to new it, uh, legislation. And I can't go next um, Sunday night, but there is a candlelight vigil in, um, in Bloomsburg on Sunday night. And Monday morning will be the, uh, the next meeting. And I'm hopeful that um, there will be a large assembly of Christian clergy there that day. I was somewhat frustrated, however, <laughs> when uh, I was invited to a, a meeting I couldn't go to this week. And um, it was a meeting that I had been invited to and was inviting all good Christians to come to the meeting and think about this. And it was like, you know what? Jews and, and you use were the first people to step up about being that. We need to be invited into the party. And some of it is we need to just keep showing up so people know that invited or not, we bring our potluck and we come. So, and they're good potluck dishes. We know that about us, right? <laughs> Um, but I was horrified by the hacking and death threats that the, that the side of justice, 
felt free to do because the Millers are ignorant of the public sphere. I think we have to step up. It makes a huge difference and it comforts the oppressed that they are seen and in my friend's word, believed. And justice is only going to happen if we do it. I believe, without, with humility, I believe we are the ones the world has been waiting for. But then we have to be worthy of that. Where do we find the courage and the force? Here and in that chalice, we say at the end of the service that we take that flame within us. It is to burn in us being rekindled by our right actions and our eventual return to the community that is our source of inspiration. The word of God, truth, justice, however you call it, should burn like a fire in our souls and a coal in our mouths. And we should breathe that holy fire out into the world. To do less is to waste our gifts and to fail that world and that word. I believe this. I believe that we are an answer to a world with a, a world that's aching with how to do things differently. May we live into our possibilities. Blessed be.